Good evening. My name is Bruce Lombardo, and you are watching myself, Baron G Rock, Kai, Shadow and Sun, Jade, and Honnell with Cigar DM. My, that's a BBC you have there. It is a dog's it's leg. A big brown cigar. Um, we are discussing how to handle player knowledge versus character knowledge. This is something that gets confused at a lot of tables, so we're going to help you out. We're going to discuss this for a couple of weeks, correct? Uh, no, this is a one one week, one shot, and we'll come back to it if we need to. Ooh, sounds like a good plan. All right. All right. The instigator of tonight's show, I would prefer if either they or would delegate a host to Ding <laughs> to uh, do this. Because I see what you did there. <laughs> Better to you than me. <laughs> it's all right, Jay. No pressure. It's the voice. We're only we're only broadcasting for a hundred ninety thousand. In time, in time, they will come. Yeah, eventually. Do you know how many comments you get, Jade, about how well you're able to organize your questions, how to keep misfits like us in line to march down the verbial. Uh, link well, okay, keep in mind that's gatekeepers, not table breakers. Like, there's know, a difference between the shows. Show, every show and I'm on, actually, where you get brought up, Jade. And, and, and the thing is, is that he's not keeping everything in line, he's hurting cats. Yeah, yeah, the, the cat hurting is fine. I would like to think of myself more of a, a um, mongoose, a Bombay. No, that was a hockey player for Mighty Ducks. Yeah, it was also, it's also uh, the typical black cat. It's Bombay. Bombay? Yeah, I'll be it. Whatever. <laughs> Salute there to our go. chat. People that were in here today, thank you so much for being uh, waiting on us and for allowing us to get things straight. First in the chat was a cracking gamer. Greetings from millions of years ago into the future. But I was but a mere toaster. Six Nation 31 Kings, looking forward to the show. I can use the distraction today. Been a hell of a week. My little Chewini tore her CRCL. I think the dog goes ACL. And have been nursing her until we can get her surgery. Ooh, Oof, that's ooh. rough. Calgar, uh -huh. take me away. Siri Bot, good to see you. <laughs> Evening, folks, says Lady. Soy Base Jeremy says, I'm here. Six Nation 31 Kings, Cracking Gamer, Lady One, Panel, and Hidden Chat Lovers. Howdy, y'all. So I base Jeremy. I think you should bring up that Native Americans, one of the Washington commanders to revert to the Washington Redskins. Maybe later. <laughs> so we based evening. <laughs> What's up, Six Nations? Aren't you Native American? At the end of the day, it's all DD or Nintendo. Greetings, Mages Musings. Oh, Mages. Greetings entry. Hello, sir. Hail to the chat, everybody. Uh, I will be, I am actually double all streaming on this into my channel because this is a one shot. I figured for those who are not already sub to me, that aren't already sub to well, this motley crew, one way or the you other. Should. Do you, do you want your channel to grow? Yes or no? Yeah, I want. <laughs> okay, so why don't we put all of the content that you can onto your right. channel? I know that sounds lame, but let's do it. Right. I mean, I'm trying to do the best for you, for Kai, for for Jade. Garrett Baron knows the name just just amazingly. So I, I want to make hacks. sure, you know, Shadow hears, Shadow hears at what, 600 subs, 700 subs? 670. Awesome. Yeah, next time he has one of those giveaways, the SOB, I'm going to make sure I follow the rules so I can throw some numbers onto the computer so I can win a freaking terrass. I'm still pissed off about that. <laughs> Sorry, man. Pretty simple rules. Yeah, but it's me. Do I look like I look? Never mind. Just never mind. I, I, I thought you were going to say something completely different. Mages Musing says, simul streams are great for cross pollinating subscribers. Absolutely. For those of you that are that were there last night in the gatekeeper chat and thought I was a little bit out of pocket, well, I do have my opinions. Okay. Jade. Yes, sir. Have your have your notes in order, sir? Uh, I have <laughs> transferred the notes to a notepad and made them bigger so I don't have to use my reading glasses this evening. I feel you. Reading glasses. What's that? Uh, We're blind. Something, something I need on a regular basis. 
I, so, like, I will all allow of us are you... blind. Shut the fuck up. I, also, between... something you don't want to wear because the light behind the camera catches on the lens and reflects right back into the camera. It's never good. What's these glasses like contact? I, <laughs> I don't want you to be bubbles. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, oh. granted uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but my vision's still pretty damn good. <laughs> uh, far vision, yes. Near vision, not so much. Hey, 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 hey. Where I know I need to bring that razor just a little bit closer to my face each time, but, you know, uh, women like the beard. Soy-based Jeremy, um, this is this is my channel, so I just I do want to make this one little statement. Uh, the issue that you're talking about, the NFL, taking it into consideration – I've not liked the NFL for about 15 or 16 years. They've kind of pissed in my cornflakes. And uh, then they overcharge for every little scrap of merchandise they try to sell, oy vey, and I'm really not into it. So if they were to burn down tomorrow and we had to go and get somebody with an actual plan that didn't require government subsidies and taxpayer money to uh, float, I would be happy to not deal with them ever again. So, if anybody wants to have a um, rebuttal, I don't watch well, football. So I got nothing. I, I, I don't watch. I don't watch uh, local sports ball or any sports ball. I, I just don't. Don't. I'm, I'm already busy enough in my daily life. I don't have time to fit other types of entertainment in. You know, it's so much. It's and. No, as some of my set friends say, yay, sports. Yeah, yes, indeed. So yeah. tonight's topic is how to handle player knowledge versus character knowledge. Um, this is something that I think every experienced game master has come across at their tables at some point in history. Um, whether the players know a little too much or they might have bought the module and read ahead. Or, you know, maybe their I friends played the module or, or their, yeah. you know, or their friends played the module before them and said, oh, hey, there's this really cool thing you really want to get, but you have to do X, Y and Z to get it. Um, you know, so every game master at every table is going to have somebody who's who thinks they have more knowledge than they should. So what are the in and, and we'll go around the table. What are the common situations uh, either at your table or tables you've been at, where the players have had more knowledge than their characters. We're going to start with that. Uh, I'm going to start with Kai on this one. More knowledge than they should. Than yeah, what are the, what are the common situations you've uh, you've found? Usually, I run into it when it comes. Honestly, I God. Few times that I actually no oh, fuck. <laughs> I've stumped them. <laughs> well, I, the thing here is, is because of the fact that I tend to um, throw a lot of odds. At, you know, I like I. I don't know because I, I I like to throw the idea of my players having like lots of ways that since I don't run modules at all and I barely use a monsters manual and. So it's hard for my players to read ahead or to okay. know ahead. And the worst I run into is when I, since I run multiple, you know, multiple layered games where I have high level characters being, you know, where I have players who are running multiple characters in the same universe, where occasionally I had the problem of a player who's, where I give a plot point to, let's say, part of a bigger puzzle and their high level character is off here doing something off in the distance. And then I give a small plot point that means nothing to the small characters, but suddenly watching the lights turn on behind their eyes going, Oh crud. If only my other character could, could know what's going on here. I could do so much with this. Not going, and here's me kind of going, yeah, I know. But luckily, these people don't know your other character. And then watching him try to warp reality, like an Albuquerque, like a warp drive, trying to figure out how to bend space and time so he 
so that way he can get the information to his other character. And I'm sitting here going, no, no, you can't. I, I hate to be reality here and say you can't, but you, you, you can't find, you know, warp space and time here. But that's about what it, the worst I run into is watching some players try to find every excuse to use the information. And I'm like, going, no, 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 you can't. Though I, I, that's the best I can, that's the best I've got is simply that. Sorry, I don't have much more. Is that what you're aiming for, or do you want some clarification? Um, I'm kind of, I, you know, I, I, I think that's fine. Um, so, hmm. I'm gonna have to think on on your answer there because uh, you gave me some stuff. I'll I'll figure out how to work it in. Um, I, that's the that's the that's the downside of being of being both a sandbox and letting players run around and playing multi level games. Is that players tend not to have a lot of um of for of forwarded you know knowledge. I mean, the best I can I, I like. If you play a sci-fi game, the worst thing can possibly go is, oh, maybe we're here in Shadowrun. Maybe we should go to the Arcology, at which point everyone goes, no, we should never go to the Arcology. I'm like, but the plot says you want to go to the Arcology. We choose never to go to the Arcology. Why? We've all read that book. We all know that the Arcology is terrible. We never want to, like, but Dan, because you said the word, the, the, the big D word, we are never going to there. I'm like, but storyline, No. I will I will find a way to, to to make you fight the I fight the AI and I'm like yeah in book three we're, we're we won't be we, we will not be part of books one or two I'm like mm. fair enough that's the only thing I got is like what shadow okay. or or occasionally like if it's L five R people jumping ahead and going oh we we know I'm like no you don't none of you know first off most of you don't even know the actual storyline good for you so. That's all I've got. I'm just on okay. opening up here. No, that, that's fine. Uh, I'll circle back to you on on. I, I've got ideas for something you can speak to, but uh, I'll circle back to you. Uh, let me get okay. to Bruce. Uh, so, Bruce, what are some of the common situations you find at your table where your players have more knowledge than their characters should? Uh, Bruce, if you're talking, your mic is muted. Okay. I I go. need to notice things more often. I, I failed my spot <laughs> check. That's All right. right. So, I, uh, my biggest problem is combat. And I'm going to say that I start putting miniatures on the table. And all of a sudden, everybody starts like rattling off their, their turn orders. What are they doing? What are they doing? Ah, you big motherfucker. And you have like nine people in the party or so and they're all sharing information so first off i'm going to say that little ticker says action set action done that's no backseats right there first off and i i'm i'm kind of stepping a little harder with that rpg grandma if you're lurking hello we miss you um if uh you start having problems with your combat. Like, you can tell the players, it's okay if you guys strategize. You know, you may want to do it before the game, but you start barking turn orders, and, like, the game's combat says if you're barking orders at people, that requires a, f a fragment of time up to a full round action for Pathfinder. And you trying to cheat your ass off you're not going to win because the the board will be flush with enemies and you'll just you'll you'll be screwed so don't be barking things like that talk about it before the game okay. when the figures start going down be plotting your your move don't be verbal you have if, if the bad guys have to do their thing if they have to talk to each other during combat they're losing actions you will too and yeah, I'll remember this if you guys are doing that. I know that sounds really strict, but that's how they wrote that. That's rules as written. 
I'm not typically a fan of rules as written most of the time. But a lot of the times when I run a combat, there's multi-stage combats where on turn one, these forces appear at said location. At turn two, these will appear. On turn four, these will appear. On turn six, these will appear. And that's just kind of how, you know, like that works. I don't know if that's truly a good idea, but the way they have it written, that's how I would prefer to play it. When I have munchkins at a table, I get really frustrated. Like, stop trying to maximize and minimize things uh, as much as you are. Your 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 persona probably would hate being as lopsided as he is. Yeah, and 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 mages are like, I left when people try to give monologue length instructions to friend in a six second combat round. That's that's the problem that I have. You have to have detailed instructions for things, and that's one of the reasons why I went to more abstract terrain. I, I got rid of the grid. We went with templates. I think that works a lot better. A whole energy ogre. That mm -hmm. is just one of my problems, and that's my largest one, so I'm just going to lay that one there on a stack of stuff to talk about. Okay. Um, let's get down to uh, Electric Avenue. Um, Connell, so when you were running, because I know, I know you do a lot of module play, and I know you do a lot of um, uh, game shop play. So do you ever have the situation where your players have read ahead in the module or have figured out what you're trying to do before you actually do it? Um, unless I have a, a somebody, hmm. unless I have somebody who's actually been at the shop when I ran it the first time, I normally don't have that problem. The problem I have is I get like a new player and around the table with some old players like us, you know, that's been around, you know, the block a few dozen times. And it's early days of the campaign. And I throw a goblin. Oh, goblins are nothing to worry about. Just need to, they only have four hit points. Or their AC is this. I'm like, don't tell them. No, 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 knock it off. I want early days for in a campaign, for especially for new players, need to be, I don't say frightening, scary. But they have to be kind of, you know, there's got to be a lot of, at, not a lot of action. There's got to be something there to draw them back, make something to make them excited. So if you're brushing off every encounter because you know the monster manual or whatever monster book, you know, for system that I'm running, you're killing it for them. Why should they come back if they know if they all, all they have to do is roll higher than the four? on one dice and depends on what weapon they use all they need to do is roll above average damage thank you for killing it for the rest of the table shut the fuck up okay so your problem is players knowing the material more than than the module or whatever you have yeah, because if i run a module okay. and i said this uh, on gatekeepers last night just because you read the book the first time doesn't mean it's the same book the second time you know, okay. I, I'm comfortable enough with pa, uh, Paizo and uh, uh, Rise of the Rune, Rise of the uh, uh, whatever Rune Lord that I will switch things up. Okay. Uh, moving over to Shadow, then, if you're there. Yeah, I'm, there you here. Are. I'm here. So, I know you've but run games. F I, I I know you've run games for decades. Um, have you ever had the situation where it seems like the players just know too much and, and they happen to use knowledge that their characters really shouldn't have? You ever have that problem? Uh, less with science fiction. I wanted to bring that up, uh, which is one of the reasons I like science fiction. It lets the players use as much of their current knowledge for their character as possible because, you know, they know things like electricity and, and physics and things like that, where in fantasy games, these characters, uh, the, the average player needs a lobotomy before actually playing because there's so much that they're going to, you know, game or metagame or however you want to put it uh, that, that I just I just don't like. But my biggest, my biggest beef with this topic is 
when when a player is about to go down and the party all know that they need to do everything completely different to the point of you know risking attacks of opportunity and all these other things just to make sure that character doesn't go below zero or whatever your death threshold is and everything suddenly becomes you know a race to keep that other character alive which should in reality result in a whole bunch of other people going down from like i said attacks of opportunity and and just stupid maneuverings and trying to get you know throw the the the, the dying character uh, a healing potion or something like that um personally i think that you know most of these games kind of blow it with the hit point concept you should almost not know how many hit points you have you know what i mean if, if we kept that secret from the players the hobby would be completely different and the not knowing how many hit points you have would make the game so much more interesting and so much more realistic when you think about you know well, am i feeling woozy yet you know if you've ever lost a lot of blood you know that feeling uh where you know you're you're about to not stand up for a good long time and wish you had some food band-aids and uh like orange juice and stuff um but we don't we don't play that way which is a shame maybe we should try it but that that's my big thing is is players just just doing crazy stuff to make sure that one guy doesn't go down when you're in the thick of battle uh you're not thinking about anybody else even if he's calling medic your your first thoughts are who is around me and how do i make them not be around me like you know down on the ground so that i can maybe not be that guy down on the ground it's not you know oh you know so and so the magic user he's getting ready to you know he's only at one hit point the whole party now suddenly knows the magic user's down to one hit point so that would be my big big hairy beef okay uh so down to baron so um when you run your tables, do you ever have the situation come up where your players happen to know knowledge that they really, really shouldn't? And what kind of, you know, what do you... I, I'm going to go ahead and lead into the next question on that. What do you do to curb it? So, yes, I have had that happen before just because of the the nature of the beast, with, especially with the groups that I play with. Uh, typically, they do play quite a bit of Pathfinder, uh, 40k, uh, you know, our uh, PTRPGs. So there's a lot of, of player knowledge that does need to get sifted through. And usually to curb that, I just start off by saying, this is where you are. These are the type of things that you know. And just kind of uh, give them a, a idea of setting those expectations of, what they what they should know, what they shouldn't know, and uh, like for instance, you know, in a forty k game, they shouldn't know that the emperor is being fed, you know, dozens of psychers a day to keep sustain his life force. You know, whereas anyone who has followed the lore knows that uh, the the knowledge of of Zenos is not common knowledge. As much as, as they like to throw, you know, when you're actually looking at the game, even even the tabletop version, they're, they're constantly p playing orcs or or cow or or whatever. Most of the the folks, the biggest concern is heretics, as opposed to xenos. You so, that's I'm sorry. You mean I don't know where Jason's um I chasing the infinite uh, museum's at? No. Aww. And neither have you ever heard of it. Aww. So I mean and, and that's the thing, is that it's just setting those two apart of the and setting the expectation um, in order to help curb this, in order to help uh you know, try to keep the game uh knowledge as as uh game uh i guess game cohesiveness as possible i mean 
everyone uh, in, in every one of us has sat at the table where we've had player knowledge and it's real tempting to use it. Uh, actually, that just happened to be this last week. Um, you know, I'm I'm really big into physics and, and science and, you know, how things work. And I was sitting at the table and something came up and what was it? The I'd asked, well, something about the, the planet having three moons. And then I would asked a question. Oh, well, well you're a dryad. Do you, can you tell me about the uh, the, o- the the oceans of the planet and, and the movements therein? And I'm like, wait, strike that. My character does not understand those physics because those physics are post uh, Renaissance. Like, just no. You know, I, I told the GM strike that. I I I would not have been even able to comprehend that question to even ask it. He's like, oh yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay. Now, see, I would have been okay with the first part, asking about the oceans. Hmm. And maybe the and then change it to maybe the currents, right? Because and, but I because that I that they would that would be, yeah I know I, I was asking specifically but, about the the lunar physics of, uh, and the effect on the oceans, um, yeah. So, um, so Kai, I'm circling back to you, and th- now this is something that no one has brought up, and I know you have brought it up on a number of occasions in previous streams. About yes. players having advanced technological knowledge from an advanced era, trying to use it in a pre-advanced society. Yes. <laughs> I told you I was going to circle back to you on this one. I know. I know. Ah. Uh, the problem is, is that I'm usually the asshole who's doing it. Um. <laughs> No lies. Well, describe it to us. Yeah. What you mean the you mean the fact that that simple that unfortunately because you can follow along simple thought processes where you start with okay how does this work and then you and I think okay I've had this done to me before and we refer to it as the purple rock syndrome or or problem it's the problem where if your players know a goal and i've done it before and they ask for something simple and easy and unless you know the entire the entire problem that they're working on ahead of time you won't see that you won't see the problem coming until it's too late so they're going to ask for so they've already worked out the entire equation in their head ahead of time they've already figured out the entire um the the entire math problem they've already got they got it already solved and so they're going to start with you and list off, I want a purple rock. That's the, the, the first question they want. Like, can I, can I make purple rocks? Well, of course you can make purple rocks. And then they will slowly but surely work their way around and then ask the entire, the entire formula out of order. They'll ask for step C, step F, step B, step G, and then they'll work their way through it. And you won't see all the pieces. You'll see each small piece is being assembled. And then suddenly at the end, they put it together. You've already okayed everything, the entire thing, every part of it you've given your stamp to, and you said as a GM, I allow that, sure thing. And then when the last piece arrives, they plug it in. And it's like the infinity gauntlet turns on at that point, or it's a zero point module that's plugged into the into the program, and suddenly it it comes alive, and then it's too late. You've all, I, they already had the end goal, and now you get to see the end goal, and the players pull out. Well, now that I know that I could turn this 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 purple rock into this thing, and you're like, oh shit, and you've I've watched my players do this, and then. And I've done this because, but the thing is, I don't cheat them by telling, well, I kind of do, because I do the exact same thing, where I will work each step of the problem. I already know where I'm aiming for, and I'm going to keep, and each time I find a problem in it, 
because of the fact that it's like to use your three body, your your three moon problem. Because I've had a similar a, a similar problem. Well, of course they wouldn't. I that's a that's a post Renaissance problem. Well, no, you had an entire world that's had the entirety of civilization. The question now comes down to how long civilization, how long people have been mo- uh, monitoring the tides. Some sailors would have been uh, I do this, and now you can figure out you can back backfill the problem. And each time the GM throws a problem at you, you can you begin to work that problem, that barrier, that blockade. And even when they say no, you attack it, and then you figure out why the answer is no, and then you keep pushing, you keep working. And then and as a GM, I've had to, I've had to. It's all I preferred smart players who ask questions because that challenges me as a storyteller. And it comes this interesting game back and forth. And as a player, I love when I have a smart GM because a dumb GM is going to tell you no. And the ignorant GM is, is going to tell you no and give you no reason. Well, no, game. And I'm like, fuck you, world. And so it's it, it's almost a metagame that's happening in the background. And it, it requires you to actually research and learn, find a problem, and then keep consistency. Because once you start playing this game with your players – or as a player attacking your GM back and forth, it becomes important to be consistent to no end. Because if at any point that you fail, what was that? What was that? I'm sorry. I have no idea what that was. In game of life. Hold on, I have to pull it up. <clears throat> Go ahead, keep speaking, guy. But no, and the thing is, is that it's a fun game you're playing. So you're trying, like, they're trying to use their inf- their advanced knowledge, their advanced idea of, because at that point, like, I want to trade. Where where do you get the idea from trade? Mine cars, they, they predate that. And I know that, and I know gravity. Okay, so, so you can't do this. Well, I figured out this. Well, you can figure out that, but you need to figure out this. And then they have to figure out a way to, and it's fun watching it's a game where you're trying to make them actually do the steps to get to there. And in game of life. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought of that because Zaphris notes only what he's told. My old right. man was okay. a, a, a personal friend of that guy. And the thing here is, like I said, that's what it really comes down to. Is like when my players use it, want to use advanced knowledge, I want to know how they got to that conclusion. And it makes and like, but it's like, well, I know it happens. No, work work me up to how you look, how you know it. And now and now it comes skills because player knowledge trying to figure out how the, the player and figure out how the character knows. And then it's just working their working your way up to a solution that ends up being. Here's the I, here's the end goal. Here's the end result, and I so much prefer that to no, you can't. Why? Because GM says so. I say so, and then I'm like, your game sucks. I quit. I I want to quit now, or I want to just change the games now. Because obviously, if I'm going to have a GM who's not going to cooperate and not be interesting, not put their brain power into it, well, I work a really hard job. So the fuck do I? But I'm here to, and I'm here using my brain power. Like, do you want me to sit back? And trust me, if you want me to sit back and turn my brain off and do fucking nothing, I will happily turn my brain off and go. I'm only here for combat, and I will fucking do that. And when I turn, and when I turn off my my logic brain, my smart brain, and turn on and turn on combat wombat murder brain, oh, <laughs> um, um, it stops being. Oh, we're here to have deep, intricate, cool creations and neat plot lines. And it turns into how many bodies can I stack? And the GM, but efficiency stacking now, motherfucker. And I wanna I, I want to kill count. And the only and the only and the only good uh, good encounter is a bad, is a dead encounter. My so my 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 caveat to that, and you know, I I've had this happen at my games. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm trying to get my Bronze Age game squared away. And this is going yeah. to become a problem in my Bronze Age game, probably yeah. more so than any other game. Um, because the Bronze Age is, you know, it's the age of it's adventure. Age. It's not really yeah. the age of discovery. No, it's um, the age of right. It's the, it's the age of, of you know, um, 
con- of conquering kings of of uh, roving yeah. marauders um so i'm gonna be running into that problem of advanced you know players having knowledge of advanced technologies and going oh well you know the auto ballista uh, you know existed at you know in rome yeah i'm like yes but that was a roman discovery not a gaulish discovery but the thing um, and the thing here and that was and iron thing, age and the thing here you're looking at then is is yeah okay that's See, it's not too hard when you're say um, late. Uh, I had late. Uh, I had post antiquity. Um, you know, I don't want to call it the dark ages, but the late middle ages to go from late middle age to okay. Here's the discoveries, I and mean, when you're looking that far back, the amount of having to work ahead is the best you can look at. Is like the um, ah. I can't, I can't pronounce it, but thanks to the, uh, thanks to Indiana Jones, it's been ruined. Um, the, the Greek geared calcul, I, I calendar device. Uh, it's Greek. I can't pronounce it. Um, like the best you're probably going to see there is, is you don't really see a lot of, a, a lot of technology, a lot of torsion engines. You're not like Do you mean the, the best you- device. Yes. That thing. The way too many, the way too many syllables. Apologize, um, device. Um, but so it's a you know, So then the question then becomes like, what? How do you, as a game master and players, uh, you know, how do you work together to avoid breaking the immersion of the setting, and you know, and maintain that consistency in the game? You know, because especially like if I'm getting ready to run a Bronze Age game, like I I need my players on the same page as me going, hey, you know, these are the discoveries that have been made. And, I, you know, these discoveries haven't been found yet. Possible suggestion is um, what usually set me off and set my players off to start running in those in those directions is always when I or the other player, like when I as a G- GM and the storyteller makes use of a device that's that's oh um doesn't fit the world so if you start to like so the the moment that somebody shows up with a with an iron sword you know it's it's star metal it's iron somebody wait will start... well, well wait it, it's are we are we playing in a a native american setting it's the bronze age so you can see a lot of bronze weapons so it's, okay, well, uh, no, the reason why I was asking that is that uh, is is this Carl Urban in uh, the undiscovered North American continent? No, it's, uh, I, I'm thinking more Mesopotamian, um, Bronze Era, you know, like, like that. that's just my example, you know, of, yeah. you know, my players wanting to have advanced technology in the game, but it's, it's bronze era. It's, it's like Mesopotamian bronze era. Like they're not going to have access to, to iron. Cause you have to dig for that. You actually have to mine it out of the ground pretty deeply. And the, and the amount of, uh, and the amount of extra energy and heat that you need to be able to make, I uh, turn iron into a useful material though. That's difficult. I, it's like you, you needed the Bronze Age collapse and the lack of, of of bronze's availability to make people have to adapt to the Iron Age and have to adapt. It leads to a, it leads to a Dark Age. It's much like if you're playing like I'm gonna use Legend of the Five Rings here for example. The mo- like nobody will really think about a Gaijin or foreigner technology until you introduce the the concept into it. Until you introduce a a chaos point. Like the sea people who show up with some kind of new weird thing, you're not gonna like if you've established the lore, your pleasure in it, and it isn't too hard to say no if the players never think it. And if you like, because like if I'm playing um, a, another really good Bronze Age game, which is Exalted, until you start showing up, until until first stage text you know gets dropped into the game. You're not exposed to it. You don't look for it. You're not. You're not contemplating how can I reverse engineer a war strider until you see as until you see the war strider. Much like how if I don't think 
and I don't see a galleon, or sorry, a, I, a big trireme galley, I'm not going to think about trireme galleys. And so until until it's introduced, you're most of the time, if your players are good players, they're not going to jump onto it. If there's if it's not in the rule book, if it's not being I hinted at, so it really is just trusting the. I hate to say trust your players, but most of us who come to the table, unless you get like me, or but I, but I'm a history dork, so I'm going to be like, oh hell yeah, but but I I'm a dork. I I love history. I'm going to be like, oh oh, oh hell yeah, we're going to be in the pre, you know pre Hellenistic era. Heck yeah, I Trojan War. I'm up for this shit. Um, I okay. want I want chariots, but. I'm not going to sit there and go, can I have stirrups? I, I know that's outside my range. And hell, most players I know don't ever ask for, don't even realize they can ask for stirrups. And I'm okay with that. Um. <laughs> okay. So, go, you know, moving along uh, to, you know, along the same lines of the question of, you know, how do we work together as game masters and players to not break immersion? Um, so, Shadow, um, Remind me of the, the example that you had given. Uh, it, it's been a bit. Um, uh, the, uh, the the hit point meter, you know. Uh, yes. Reaching empty. Thank you. So how how do you work with your players when um, you know when that's becoming a thing? Like how do you prevent that from becoming a thing? Of you know the the players going, oh guys, I'm at one hit point. Um, usually, uh, I. You know that that'll that'll happen like early on, especially at low level. You know, because the first combat, someone's down. Um, I, I let them know that uh, you know you you know you're going down, um, and I usually uh, just let the chips fall where they may. Okay, player X is going to go help player Z. Well, as soon as he takes that 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 dumb move toward there, then I go, okay, opportunity attack, opportunity attack, opportunity attack. Okay, now you got two people going down. And that th th that's all it takes, you know? Um, a, you know, a, a, a first level party kill in, in my circle is a pretty common thing. You know what I mean? Uh, if you guys don't fight smart and fight together and like, stick together in a big chunk to where you all like go after the same orc or goblin i mean you know it, it, it it's not how combat was really fought but if you're going to play the game you better understand that um leaving any any of your you know flanks or your back open i am going to jump on it okay if if you are apart from the group the group that you're fighting is going to jump on that like you know cheap on kmart so you know the old don't split the party that's a that's even more so true in combat stick together because if you can't like as the cleric touch the guy and heal him then you aren't doing your job you should be in the second row as opposed to the back row if you're if you're the heal bot then you better be ready to your do your job and you know fighters going you know to to, to run off and, you know, even take a couple of steps too many away from the group. Okay, every every orc around you is just going to go, okay, they're, they're smart enough to know that. You know, basic wolves and things like that, they're going to go after the one guy, not the group. The group is, it's just, it's just you know, simplicity, you know. The, the idea that, you know, when, when you have, you know, fighters like, sort of spreading out trying to do these weird things or or go after that one guy no you need to move together like like a you know a well-oiled machine together one guy steps forward everybody behind you steps up you don't like take six steps away from the group and, and just just you know think you're going to go all conan and just start sweeping them away because you've got the hit points well as soon as you do that everybody's just on you it's just too easy and eventually they okay. learn. I'm not going to tell them, you know, oh, well, if you do this or you do that, that's that's not my that's not my place. It's their job to learn. And for the most part, I've been playing with, 
people who are not new to real combat or game combat, they kind of got that, you know, back in the 80s or 90s or 2000s or what have you. They kind of learned that. Uh, so it, it's not a huge issue. But if it happens, I'm going to take full advantage of it. E even the, okay. the dumbest kobold knows, you know, dogpile. You know, it's funny you, you say the dumbest kobold. That's like the one race in the games I run that players will never show a flank to because the kobolds are the trap makers. They are the ones that are the most conniving, seek the least amount of face to face time, unless right. they have like eight to one odds. If they've got eight to one odds, oh shit, they've got serious amounts of nuts. Their wavels are huge and swollen, and you're fucked. But other than that, no. Scamper, hide, lay traps, lay traps, lay traps, hobble, get the uh, get the party's movement rate redu reduced, and then uh, af after you've got them, you know, like a third winded, then the kobolds start to show their faces. They'll start, you know, actually pop around corners, exposing themselves and letting fly with with uh, crossbows and other things. The, the kobold alchemists will have various. Uh, Various things like maybe some sort of like faux uh, phosphorus style arrows or crossbow crossbow bolts just for that extra burning sensation. Oh, reminds you of camp, doesn't it? Oh yeah, I love this. So, well, what about you, Bruce? Like, how do you prevent your players from breaking immersion? My uh, my table absolutely does not believe in immersion. I don't oh, know what okay, their then. problem is. I, I love my table. I do. They've ran with me for the past three or four years. But they they treat this like it's their time to not role play. Like they they try not to involve themselves with that. If if there's more than five minutes of RP going on, like I got one guy, he'll start walking around the room starting to examine everything in my apartment. Or he'll like turn off his microphone at his place and he'll just start jamming on his guitar until he hears words like roll initiative or figures moving around on the, the battle mat. Uh, other play, other players in my table, like Melinda and Janet, I mean, I'm not trying to pick on my females, God bless them, but like they they love the RP. Like that's where they typically, you know, get to do things that they never have happen in the real world, you know, and the role play is something they really like. But I've made a, I, I've, I've got a table that, you know, is pretty split. Like, they don't really enjoy the RP. Connell will tell you. Connell, off mute. BBC out. Okay. Uh, what, what, what's the role play at my table like? It's non-existent for the most part. I will role play if I put in a situation. I will role play. Chris will role play. Uh, the females in your campaign role role play. Uh, Garrett will tell you go fuck yourself. Uh, YouTube go fuck yourself. People in chat go fuck yourself. I'm not going to role play at all. Go fuck yourself. Yeah, they, uh, they, 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 I don't understand that at all. Like the, the the YouTube is like these are people that don't have a game and they want to watch you guys, but you're telling them to go fuck themselves. That's that's crazy. Am I being? Am I wrong? No, that 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 they that, that's that's the crazy part about it. Like. My chat is like there to, to watch a game. You know, they're like, hey, Bruce is running. Let's see what's going on. And like my fucking table gets upset because the chat's there. And they're like, no, well, we, we're running online. Uh, I don't know if you guys understand this. I've been doing this for like 12 years. And they get butthurt. And I'm like, stop being butthurt. I think it's more than just, I think it's more one person gets butthurt. The rest of us is like, whatever. Chris basically yeah. ignores the chat. Because he's there to game, not to be a personality on YouTube. Oh, I, and I can, I can like admire that at the very least. But there are people in the chat that, if they had the opportunity to be at the table or have Chris RP at theirs, they yeah. would, they would oh, be I, like, dude. Yeah. Yes, we, we we've got a honest like f eight to five. Five to five to ten people that watch us on a regular basis on every other Saturday, and they're really not disappointed by the lack of RP. They're just happy to see people running a game. And if if that's all I get, if I don't have you know, Shauner's uh, 
dance theater, or excuse me, uh, interpretive dance, if I don't have uh, people with funny accents and like with an erudite sense of humor, if, if I don't ever get those, but I can still run my game, I'll be happy. I, 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 don't, have now? I don't have everything I want, but I, I've got it kind of close. Like, like I, I might need to split myself into two different Bruce's and one of them will just have board gamers and guys that like I want to roll this shit have. Okay, well let's get over here with Thor, and then uh, you know then I've got you know my other the, the other players that you know like they could take or leave the chat. But if you give them a chance to role play for experience points, they're dude. I'll sit up and beg. <laughs> what, what, so Kai, you had your hands up. What's up there, Hoss? I'm one of those people who. Watches watches routinely at least the last half half of a match uh, of a session and then and then kind of go boy I would like to and then I realize no it's just combat I'd be bored I'd be the one walking off like call me when combat's over. I mean, Bruce's Bruce's table is awesome. I enjoy it every uh, every Saturday, including this coming Saturday. Uh, it normally starts at one and will roughly run for anywhere from six to eight hours. So, so co- check us out this coming Saturday. Need to plug that in really quick. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, Bruce's k- k- table has the most unique personalities, excluding myself. I, I'm excluding myself personality wise. And Chris knows Pathfinder front to back. I know majority of it. Of course, Bruce run- knows that he runs it. Everybody else, you don't have them kind of not especially Janet. Janet doesn't know what she doesn't know. And sometimes she needs to be reminded. But I'm pretty okay with her not knowing some things because sometimes I get a chance to like, I I use her as an audience character. And I'm going to recommend anybody that ever gets a Janet at your table. And when I mean a Janet, I mean somebody who has gone through life and they've done things and they've really had a good life and they've, they've lived. You get a grand a grandparent at your table and it's their first game. You can use that as your audience character to help tell your story. Because when things are getting ready to go on, you kind of tell the table, everybody shut your mouth. What I need to do is instruct this player on what their character does know about the world. That way, they're not all thumbs or given something that would not be seen as normal. Because if you're all playing fifth level characters and she's on her second session, she doesn't have the amount of years her character does in this type of situation. She's still a newbie. And so you get a chance to revisit rules. You get a chance to revisit the world. You get a chance to impart a little bit of lore. And you get a chance to help remind your longstanding players that are probably face down looking at Facebook and hitting like on Instagram. Oh, fuck. Bruce ran that service for us three months ago, and I forgot about that. And it's a chance for you to do a quick aside and re-plug something, a, a valuable clue. And if your players have, if your players pay attention, and by the way, people that play these games pay attention. Your phone or tablet's not more important than the people around you at the table. You get a chance to have three minutes to revisit something without going previously last time at this table. You don't you don't have to do that. You have your audience character that you can placate to. And that's like one of the best reasons. Like I, I'm I'm never wanting to not have new players join my game, but I recommend that you guys try to have at least with your warm market, as I say, with the people that know you, that appreciate you, that like you, that want to that want to hang out with you, that's kind of important right there. Give them the time to do that and then bring them into your game. If they don't know the game, it's okay. Just here's your character and we'll part as we go along. Okay. So... Connell, you had said that um, the problem that you have uh, with player knowledge versus character knowledge is them knowing the monsters. Yeah. What? How do you, as a game master, and you know, speak to your to those players? Like, how do you get them onto your side and not 
you know, breaking the immersion of the table and, and giving away the information about the monsters that you're running. I I try, you know, I'll talk to them after game saying, hey, listen, I know that you've played this uh, Pathfinder as long as I have, if not longer. But these newer players, they, they the thrill is still there. They're still in their honeymoon stage of the, you know, gaming. Don't ruin it for them. If that doesn't work, uh, I am running uh, Rise of the Lord through 5th edition. And if uh, at least once or twice where I have a counter and um, I know they're going to spout, I'm going to say, well, we're going. there's a troll. Trolls are allergic to fire. How the, you know, whatever. I'll throw something from uh, Dungeons & Dragons that Pathfinder doesn't have in their uh, monster bestiary. Like, um, um, uh, I'm thinking, uh, Beholder. I'll throw a Beholder in there. And they're like, oh shit, that's you can't do that. This is a Pathfinder game. I know this is my game. I, I can switch as long as I can make the mechanics work. I can run any monster in here that I want. You know, as long as I stay true to the story, what monsters you killed this week is really up to me. And if I throw them off uh, with a monster that they're just not aware of, a Rust monster, a Beholder, um, there's a couple other uh, truly D and D monsters that didn't crap the crossover. There's not many, but there are a few. Uh, it just throws them off their game, and they normally shut up for a little while. I mean, I'm not trying to punish my players, but at the same time, I got to keep things interesting because, especially with new players, if they lose interest because you robbed them of their honeymoon state, they'll leave the game. They there's. It's five dollars. They get a five or six dollars, depending on what's going on. They can spend elsewhere, and I need to make sure that the interest stays valid. Uh, it stays. What's the term? Evergreen for them to when yeah. to continue. So I will flip the switch uh, script as it be on when it comes to monsters. Um, okay. This one guy, he's like, I played this years ago. I know who the last guy is. And it was like right when you guys are about ready to fight uh, the Rune Lord. So I use, uh, who's the undead guy from uh, D&D? Vaknar, Vickner, whatever. Vecna. Vecna, yeah. Yeah, I got his stats off of 5th edition. Off 5th edition, and I threw him into a situation like, wait, wait. No, he's not supposed to be able to do that. Oh, by the way, fuckers, you know that book you guys been, those series of books you've been collecting? That's the tomb of uh, uh, ultimate evil. You just powered him up. Have fun with this, you sons of bitches. And that's how I will keep them from not cheat, not cheating, but not cheating. If that makes sense. Sure. Um, okay. Connell, I'm going to need to get you some some uh, pieces. Uh, there, there's a a module that was written by Necromancer Games, which was then put into Demons and Devils, uh, I think it was V1 or D1 for Necromancer games, but there's a module where there's a bunch of rumors about this old Holy Avenger that was lost to time, and so the players kind of recognize they don't have a Holy Avenger, and so they go off in search of this, and over the two months, they make their way to this remote land where they find where there's a, an actual temple. And when they go inside, they see six cultists there among the lit browsers. And they're, they're enjoying themselves. There's, there's a little bit of like uh, smoke from, from these hookahs. And when the characters are noticed sneaking into the temple, the cultists wave them in and talk to them about a celebration, but they're talking with an older accent or old tongue. And then the, the cultists start to do this funny dance. And they're all doing like this interpretive dance, but if you make a knowledge planes 27 or something like that, you recognize it as a dance of destruction. And the cultists are wearing illusion bells. They're rocks. There's six of them. <laughs> and if you kill the rocks, good luck. Uh, good luck, especially with your wizard intact. Um, you you get to uh, find this this weapon that's in this this stone, and there's a woman that's chained to a rock, and she's telling you, 
pull the stone from the rock and cut me free. Pull the stone from the rock and cut me free. But it's actually a unholy avenger, and when you grab a hold of it, that's when the demon inside it can offer the paladin either a cyanide pill or he can change him to an uh, anti-paladin. And now you have to figure out if you're going to try to get your anti-paladin friend a holy avenger or a, an atonement spell or if you have a TPK on your hands. But I just, I, 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 I just, I'm throwing ideas out there. Somebody in the, somebody in the chat, writing this down. Okay. I, I hope that's being recorded. <laughs> so I, I just think this is. I'm sorry, Mages Musings. I hope you have a good day. Get sir, get yourself some uh, uh, pickles and 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 drink more water. Seriously. Um. But I, I'm hoping that you use something like that because. Let the players like look for a holy avenger, but let some prick along the way steer them towards an unholy avenger because you need an evil artifact in your campaign to start a new set of events. Mm -hmm. And it'll help change up your dynamic for your, you know, Rise of the Room Lords. Did I say that a lot? I, 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 I have a paladin in my care. I want a paladin that's a dwarf in one of my campaigns. I'll just switch it out from being a, a sword to a hammer and he'll, he'll lose his shit. Okay. But yeah, I like that. Oh. What about you, Baron? Uh, did you, we touch on the topic of uh, how do you uh, get your players on board to not break immersion? Yeah, well, I, I, I kind of touched on it with the whole, uh, you know, have have that that conversation and set that expectation. Uh, you know, okay. you, you know, you your player knows knows X Y Z. Anything above and beyond that, they don't know. Okay. Um, let's see here. So what your, so your method is to work with your players, like before the game even really gets rolling to foster good communication and trust between the player and the game master then. Correct. Okay. Um, it, it, I, I found, I, I found that it's the easiest way to head off those issues. If you address them before they become a problem. Okay. Does anyone else uh, uh, do that, or do they do, or do you guys do something differently with, uh, with like addressing the the metagaming issue before the game starts? Uh, like, yeah, go go for it, Shadow. You you, you got to address it the very first time it comes up, and keep hammering it in, hammering it in if it becomes it and maintains, you know, or continues to be a problem. You got you got to let them know um, in no uncertain terms. Hey, you don't know that your character doesn't know that. Uh, fortunately, uh, you know, depending on the game you're playing, it's not always that big a deal. I, I I find it's really like I said this before. It's it's mostly with games prior to you know our tech level or you know here on Earth right now. You know, if you're playing anything else, even you know, a, a lot of Call of Cthulhu games, most players can walk in and use what they've got and, you know, not really be, you know, metagaming too much or breaking out a character too much, depending on the, the specific kind of character. Uh, you know, because I, I don't use a lot of the things I've heard guys with, you know, uh, mirroring Earth's technological eras. You know, my world... You know, like with the, the three moon problem uh, earlier, that might not necessarily, you know, only be something discovered later on. It could have been discovered early on. You know, uh, you were talking about your Bronze Age game. Well, uh, you might want to throw in like like Atlantis or, or something like that to help some of your players that are more bent that way. You know, it's like, well, you know, you're, you're a shipwreck survivor from Atlantis. Atlantis doesn't necessarily need to have been sunk, but, you know, that way you can kind of, you know, allow them to use some of their stuff as opposed to just cutting it all off because let's face it, each and every one of us has no idea what it would li be like to be a middle age, a middle ages person. We, we can't even imagine all of the things that we would have to forget. I mean, literally have to relearn everything and that's a really hard concept for people to to grasp, you know, especially beginning players. They're, they're, they're going to be thinking, oh, I got this great idea. Well, 
You know, we could be having to say you don't know that all the dang time if we really thought about it. It's like your character wouldn't know to do this. Your character might not know to do, do that. Even some of the basic tactics of, you know, throwing oil, you know, like oil flash and Molotov cocktails. Your magic user or your priest might not know anything about it. There are people here on Earth right now that wouldn't know how to make or use a Molotov cocktail efficiently. So there's a whole lot of things we'd have to, you know, unlearn. So it, we, we've, we've got to cut the the, the metagaming and, and the out-of-character knowledge off as early as possible to get them to start trying to actually think in the mind of that character because there's so much that they're they're going to know that they shouldn't. I mean, you, you could spend all game long doing that, and if you just do it a couple of times real quick and, and explain why that their character wouldn't know this, and there's a lot of other things, you know, think about your character, what he would really know as opposed to what you know. Okay. So then what... what uh, so... Along those lines of thinking, what kind of tips do you have for game masters, um, you know, to manage some of that metagame other than, you know, just saying, hey, your character wouldn't know that. Like what other things can game masters do to say, you know, to kind of say that, but in maybe a different way, like your character may not know that, but, you know, somebody else in the world might. I, I would maybe give them the opportunity to try to tell me how they learned that. Like, like, okay. explain to me how your character would know that instead of, well, you just don't know that. Well, where did you learn that? Or where did you hear about that? As opposed to you just don't. And, you know, if they can give me a couple of sentences that are, that are really interesting, then I might, you know, add that to their, you know, my mental version of their backstory and, and maybe bring that in. You know, maybe if they said, you know, so-and-so, you know, my great uncle told me, you know, around the campfire, this story. Well, I might bring that great uncle into the story later on. So make it, you know, use it, but you know, but at least make them justify where they got the information. Yeah, okay. uh, Connell, you you are muted, and uh, you wanted to chime in on that. Yeah, um, I kind of have like an example for that. When I was in your campaign playing Darian, me as a human. Yeah. I'm not very, I'm not a very big gun person. Everybody who's ever sure. heard me talk about it on the subject, I'm not a gun guy. That's not my bag. I like my bow and arrow. Bows and arrow, a bow hasn't really changed in the design for the most since its creation. I mean, it's gotten better, but for the, you know, it's a stick with a string. Uh, but anyways, going back to Darian, Darian, I actually had to. Okay, my character is a gun inventor he invents guns okay what do you know about guns uh i know how to pull the trigger that's and, and i know how to clean them you know i could probably figure out how to clean a long uh barrel if i had or a long rifle if i had to so i had to push myself not go on google and you know give me designs for new guns but actually okay what kind of guns would they've had the basic guns that would have been uh, blunderbusses that would have been you know uh, long barrels these, these things what can you do with this what would his world physics let you get away with well we're about ready to buy a vampire well i have a way to shoot projectiles out of a barrel let's shove a stake in there and see how that works not that i know it would or would not work in real life but i had to take that leap of faith as one would say it, the mechanics would work yes technology what we know now what we know into a, a Western campaign is completely, we know too much. The players just know too damn much. But if you have a player like me with Darian, who really doesn't know all that much, I think as a DM, I think having conversations with him like me and you did over Darian's weapons had to be not awarding. I'm not trying to boost my own ego, but had to be a little bit more interesting than having to, have the conversation on the other side. You know too much. Your character won't know this. Knock your shit off. So I think you need to hmm. prop up one side of it and downplay the other side of it. There's got to be some kind of a balance. A give and take, yeah. And, and don't subscribe to balance. It's a false god. Um, but, 
So, but but keep it fair. So when when you so you bring up a point about uh, one of the games I ran that you were at, and you're right. You know, you're you the player knew next to nothing about how firearms function. Um, you you know you pull the trigger. You know uh, the the hammer engages the the primer, and by some you know uh, magic chemical reaction, it it makes the gun go bang. Right. Um, but you know, I I to prepare for that game, I studied, I think every firearm that had been invented, um, or every firearm that was in a book that I could f- read up on. And I, I studied the invention of firearms through the ages, all the way up to about World War One, which is where the campaign took place. Was around World War One uh, technology. Um, and you know you had pepper boxes you had uh clocked worked uh guns that would rotate barrels not you know not not you know not just the the cylinder it would rotate the whole damn barrel just to get to the next round on the chamber yeah. um you know kind of like a, a gatling gun of some kind That's what um and you know you're right you did come talk to me about it and, you, and you're like hey you know what would this character know? Like, here's what I think I would know. And I'm like, okay, no, here, you know, your character, you know, is of this family line. These are the kind of weapons they, they develop, you know, this is where, you know, your, your niche is, this is where your knowledge pool is and exists within. Uh, and I gave you the, all the knowledge you needed for that character and kind of, I, I set you up for success on that. Um, and, you know, and that's, I think that is part of the the game master's responsibility is to set your players up for success, but don't you know you know don't hold them back necessarily, but also don't like push them too far. You know, you give them the tools they need to work with, but then let them work with it and see what they do. Um, so I, I gave you the the knowledge that you needed. Uh, to to play the character and and to be immersed in the in the game, and then you're like, hey, can I make bullets that are hollow? And I'm like, well, technically, yes, hollow points do exist. Uh, oh, yeah. you, you know, where do you, where are you going with this? And you're like, well, I want to get like an ampule, like a lead glass ampule, and I want to fill it with holy water. Okay, you know what? Let's let's work that out and and you know give me you know rolls over the course of time or whatever and you know you will develop the technology so it doesn't break the moment you fire it, um, and it, you know your your playing of the character and I, I know uh, several several individuals weren't happy with the character you're playing because they didn't f- they didn't feel like you were using your firearms to their fullest potential, but you know what. The way you played the character was fine. I, I enjoyed it, and you seem to enjoy it, uh, which is really awesome. But you know, your development of you know technology or the, the the bullets that had different effects to them. I'm like, oh, that's really awesome. I'm gonna go ahead and let that happen. Like you're like, hey, Addy bullets. They they should just be able to punch through things, right? I'm like, anything that's uh, you know not of their hardness or harder, sure. Um, you know, they, they'd be able to punch through one, two, maybe three objects without, you know, losing trajectory. Um, uh, but you're going to lose speed. So, and I, I was willing to work with you on that. So, um, moving over. Interesting. Oh. Addy bullets with exit wound makes for interesting. Uh, yes, the exit wound enchantment <laughs> makes for interesting situations. Uh, it, it makes for getting rid of zombies in lines very quickly down a very narrow corridor um so uh kai um do you ever work with your players you know to to disarm their metagaming knowledge or um you know allow them some of the knowledge to influence the game in some way or capacity yeah i do okay because i mostly to the tech i to the use of well, because I, I like to, to to give players the ability to grow their own support structures. I know most games do that. You know, we're like, oh, you have minions. No, I let people grow. You know, I've had some players who are like, I want to be able to have X, you know, X that thing. I'm like, all right. So I, I have one player who he loves to know everything that's going on in the world. He wants he wants to be able to walk in and get the president's daily briefing 
each day of the se- uh, each day or month of the campaign. And so rather than you know rather than using meta knowledge, he puts the I, I work with him to put in the effort to create his own version of say like the CIA, the NSA, the ubiquitous, the uh, imperial intelligence. I I give him the tools to be able to sit down in it uh, you know in his darkened you know his darkened headquarters and get his get the intelligence briefing of the day so that way like and i've had multiple players do this and so one you know they'll create you know the daily planet or their version of it you know they'll create modern you know modern news networks and intelligence agencies this is the way that they can that way i can feed them information because you know they hate being blindsided by like, and then out of nowhere, you know, the orc army of doom appears. Well, where the fuck was our warning there? Where was our trip lines? Uh, there's a zombie invasion. Who the fuck didn't, who, how did no one see this coming? And my, and I'm like, well, no, well, if you'd only talk to the town crier, he might have known something or the local bard. No, they want the ability to go, okay, hey, there's a, there's a lot of weird people who are dying due to a wet market um, infestation over in um, Five Kingdoms Over. Well, how do we know? We, oh, well, I've got a, I, I, I've got an organic, I, you know, I've got some, I, I got some, you know, human resources and, and assets in the area. They found out what's going on. They phoned, they phoned it in. They have no idea what's going on here, but we have another problem over here. And then it gives me a chance to, to work with them so that way they can focus on what what knowledge they want to use and that way I can abuse the fuck out of them. And if they want to like, if they want to push, you know, an advanced technology or research new magics, I give them access to, well, you could build an organization that allows you to make those, I make those discoveries, make make the medical push that you want. Make the, I, if you want to be, you know, use your idea of, I want, I want, you know, auto mail. I want the ability to have full metal alchemist auto mail. So I want to have the entire organization and research history to be able to make that and have that. So that way, when you inevitably pull out the sort of sharpness, well, I don't like that weapon at all. I think put it back in the box. Um, that way, when I start ch- chopping off arms and legs, they can just go, well, I have robot arms and legs now. And I'm like, yeah, and cybernetics are now available. Magical cybernetics. Yeah. Or having biological research. Like if, if the, I want players who like, if they use advanced knowledge for like, I want super weapons. I want advanced poisons. I want biological enhancements. I want mechanical enhancements. Give them ways of rather than saying no, work with them and like, start figuring out like, start to help them work their way out to be able to get them or find them the ways to be able to have that without just saying you can't have that. My game is all about being being knuckle dragger boring motherfuckers who just sit there and swing swords all day and cast by one fireball because magic's too complex to think about. Hurt derp, here's my spells. Um <laughs> herp, hey, this spell was written 25,000 years ago and nobody's ever found a better version of this spell. That is how it was written, and I will never think about how magic works. Magic is a mystical, pow- mystical, all-powerful thing that has extremely well-written rules, and nobody shall ever deviate from these rules. And if you are, you are a heretic, and we will burn you. No, yeah. This is from the from the Earth Dirt a- Annual. I mean, I like being warm. <laughs> hey, you know, there's a magical Inquisition out there who who will stab and burn any spellcaster who dares to create their own spell or ask a question about how magic works, because because. The holy books were written by by uh, by grand and powerful wizards in the in ancient past, and no, and everyone is retarded. Even your twenty your twenty intelligent wizard, he's retarded. Your twenty wisdoms cleric never asks questions. You, the, I have magic in my blood. Uh, sorcerers never contemplates how to actually, you know, utilize their powers better. Nope. I have the same three hundred spells that were written in a book. And God help you if you ever deviate from that section. But no, I am giving players ways to actually do interesting things to push the limits. And, and it's like, if you can't do it yourself, give you the tools. If you want to put the work in, if you want to put the effort in, if you want to do something creative and interesting, 
oh my god i'm gonna fucking give you the, all the tools you work i'm gonna give you homework and paperwork and bureaucracy to go, to go with it and and usually most players when they see the pile of work since i love paperwork i love bureaucracy and most people just go i don't like bureaucracy i just go see that guy at the other table talk to him he'll help you do all your all your paperwork and you watch him just kind of put the um the green visor back on and go yeah i'll do it for a share of the profits or access to your research and people go mm, uh the accountant wants to share the profits that's not good I mean, and here's me do it yourself then and you teach your players to be smart or teach them to be complacent and you know what a lot of players are knuckle draggers and don't want to do anything that's not that's not in the book and but some players do want to use advanced knowledge and then i give them the tools to use it if they're willing to put the work in if they don't want to put the work you know what they don't get shit. i remember offering so Jay blueprints for some of the gun designs i was fucking thinking about it's like no there's no need because i don't need to see your nonsense he didn't put it that way because he's a nice person but we all know no one needs to see hey. Connell's nonsense <laughs> Hey, you know what? So, the best actually, the best thing about nonsense is I like it when somebody hands me nonsense because at that point we look at, you know, the pit, pit it to the refrigerator macaroni art plan that some players give me. And I go, you know what? Most of your idea sucks, but there's a gem in here. And then we just <laughs> sit there and decode it. And you know what? Maybe, you know, thanks to you, someone might go off into a whole new idea. And you know what? That shoulder mounted uh, spear chucking gun, uh, a black powder powered spear chucking gun. Why the fuck not? <laughs> and so, and, and everyone else, I've got a bullet. I've got, and suddenly here's Connell in the background, and this hyper velocity javelin comes flying and I uh, flying and impales the fucker to a tree. And like, guns can't do that. This ain't a gun, motherfucker. It's mine. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Um, so speaking of, of the weapons, so Mendy had a question, uh, or yeah. Mehdi had a question. Uh, the question is, uh, did you list the pros and cons of each weapon type? Now, Mendy, or Mehdi, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you a question. Uh, who is that directed at? If that's directed at me, I, I can definitely answer to that. Uh, but if you're asking that to the panel, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll ask it to the panel. So, uh, while he gets back, um... I like to welcome Hungar to our game, to our uh, to our show. Yep, welcome Hungar. I would love to be in a game with Hungar. That would be just be the that would be fun. The thing here is that you can have a lot of fun, up, brother. Fun coming up, I uh, coming up with with interesting um, abilities and rules and concepts and special special traits. You know, it, it, there's so many fun ways of doing it and making it so that it's more interesting than just simply. Okay. All rifles are one d ten. Fuck you. <laughs> so, uh, so Mehdi says uh, yes, me specifically. Um, okay, so uh, when I was going through doing my research for the guns on my my like World War One era uh, game, um, and it was set in my own world, so it wasn't Earth. Um, but I, you know, I used a lot of the the concepts you know from that we discovered along through the ages. Uh, to make those weapons and yeah some of them had distinct flaws like uh you know they, they had a certain rate of fire that they could never get over um you know in a single six act, six second round they just could not fire bullets that fast um there were weapons that um completely you know unrealistic to our world uh, like the the was it door knocker it was a 51 caliber uh hand cannon that held one round it was meant for breaching uh steel tank doors um or shooting really pissed you know, off so, dragons or shooting really pissed off dragons <laughs> um <laughs> but you know so yeah i did i did learn what the strengths and weaknesses of each weapon were and i tried to put them um onto paper you know in a, in a method that would allow my players to make educated you know decisions on what kind of weapons they wanted to carry if they wanted to carry firearms of any kind um and you know some of them were the misfire rates like i i would look through the the data and I, i'd be like okay so this has a misfire rate of like uh one percent over the course of you know ten thousand rounds Okay, so I, I know what that misfire rate is going to translate to in a D20 roll. Um, you know, it's, I, I'm, I was able to, you know, work it backwards enough and get it 
into a game was it perfect no not by any means was not perfect um did my players have fun with it yes uh, I, I i'm being biased and i'm gonna say yes but you know that's one of my players right there uh so connell did you have fun with it yeah uh there was a minor i had a few minor issues with some of the decisions that were being made but at the end of the day i had a great time um just yeah i know i had a great time and given the chance I've been told I need to, or there's a certain gun that needs to be recovered and reholified that bugs the ever living <laughs> shit out of me that I haven't got a chance to go <laughs> taken care of. So yeah, no, I had a great time. <laughs> yes, that was a much later game. Um, I want to keep so, uh, uh, Mehdi, if that answers your uh, let's hear steampunk, but more reality based. Uh, yes, it was a very. It was actually based on Iron Kingdoms. Um, that's where I got a lot of my core material from. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's see here. I'm just looking through chat. Some looking parts for questions of Iron, and whatnot. Iron Kingdoms are really good. Like some yeah. parts of that uh, of that campaign setting are really good. I just like there's some parts of the written lore they've got that I'm just wondering. Wait, what the fuck? Are you smoking? Right. That's my, you know, I, I mean, you have to, if, if you get into Iron Kingdoms, like, just keep in mind, you'll need your college rule notebook to start notating what has to change. Oh, yeah. Uh, to, to answer you, Flady, on the 50 cal handgun, um, so I actually lifted that from an anime called Pumpkin Scissors. Um, it's a, like, post-war uh, uh, anime and I just really enjoyed the the concept of the gun that was in there. So, anyway, um, enough uh, yeah, on that. <laughs> but uh, no, thanks for the question. Um, I hope uh, I hope I gave you a, a decent enough answer. Um, so, getting back to topic question, uh, Bruce, you uh, have not had a chance to answer this because you were away. Um, no, you're fine. Uh, so. What are some tips for managing metagame uh, knowledge uh, or using out of character knowledge even uh, to influence game decisions at your table? Like what kind of tips do you have for game masters uh, when those moments or opportunities uh, arise? Well, I, I recommend that while using the basic player's handbook, dungeon master's guide and the requisite bestiary, or monstrous manual for whatever version of the game you are playing is always a good and healthy standby for relatively new tables. As your players gain more knowledge about the game world, as your players level up their characters, and as they go into years with you at table, I'm just going to say that you should rely on those basic monsters, those basic magic items, less and less and less and you should you should give players like a basic knowledge like hey listen this is a giant and he's now in front of you but instead of being large this fire giant's huge okay he's bigger than normal he also seems to exude some sort of like natural aura Kind of like what your paladin does for good, but his is of a different sort. And if you get too close to him, you seem to, like, catch fire. And you just, like, don't want to use basic monsters at your game because your players have seen the goblin. They know that the goblin is a D8 hit points, probably four. They know that he probably uses a horse choppa if he's a two-handed goblin fighter. They probably recognize that he probably has these archetypes as set attached to him. But I would not suggest that you use basic monsters at all. I would suggest that if you do, you alter them. Or you give some narrative clues that this is not a normal character like what you fought before. This, uh, th this, this skeletal undead stands 30 foot high and he has probably uh, about as much reach as most huge giants. Good luck. You know, things like that. And I, I would not use those things because you don't want... you. The game is about awe and wonder. So you don't want to use the standard tripe after level 
five or after your second year together, I would not suggest it. I would suggest that you alter your game a bit. And I would suggest as a GM, you endeavor in growing. You you ask friends for recommendations or you listen to other GMs. If you're running a game that is no longer supported, uh, go to your local half price books and see if there's a whole glut of them on the shelf and you can pick them up for cheap, especially the ones you don't have. Do get yourself an extra copy of the core rulebook and hardcover if you prefer that one because the binding is shit and yours will eventually die. Okay. Um, I, I, would also I, recommend... I have several copies of my core books. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I would recommend that if you plan on running a game, get really comfortable with it and don't just rely on books to give you new ideas. This is the game hobby that Gary Gygax and, and Dave Arneson bequeathed on us. And this entire hobby depends on GMs like you in order for the game to evolve. And so any contribution you can make to your table might not just be something for your table. It might be talked about later on. It might be spread. It might be shared. Uh, somebody might see a live stream of you in action. And now what you're doing is just quote, normal for your other table. So don't think that you don't have an influence. There's a lot of influence that each one of your voices has. And that sounds weird, but three, four years ago, people were thinking that fifth edition would never end. Fifth edition is going to be the way of the future. This is like, it's an IP edition. This is never going to get updated. We ought to stay with this game forever. And then 2022 came along and Watsy dropped the bomb. Hey guys, we're not doing a new edition, but we're going to issue some new books because you need to, you need to buy all of those because, you know, reasons. And we're getting away from books. So just buy the PDF for the same price. I'm sorry, but when it comes to my gaming, my gaming and quite a few other aspects of my, uh, my enjoyment, I like hard copies. I like hard copies of my books. I like hard copies of the movies I enjoy because, you know, you never know if, for, for a random situation where you're going to be somewhere where you don't have the Internet or the Internet is just no longer a thing in your life at the current moment. But if you have hard copies of the books or things that you enjoy, you still have them. Yes, yeah. Kai. And I'm, I'm not trying to, to lecture. I'm sorry, Kai. You're assuming I haven't already pre-downloaded everything onto it onto several on several portable backup drives and have several portable uh, solar-powered battery packs, so that way in the event that I could, in the event of no power at the end of the world, I cannot just boot up my, the, the tablet and run it and run it eternally to keep jamming off my digital hard drive. That, <laughs> that's fair. That that's incredibly fair. If, if you are totally unprepared and haven't downloaded all your material onto your phone ahead of time, what kind of Fucking sap are you? You need to make sure you're ready for everything. There's no internet. Already have all my books. I, I don't have access to my cloud drive. Already have it saved my phone. I have all my kicker sheets. What the hell are your problem? I have I have backups on backups. But I, I, I know I have I know I have dead tree format. But you know what? That's the backup reserve in the event that, the, that I have nothing. But I will always be digital. Don't worry about that. And just, but it's, I've, I have ways. I too of have doing embraced it. the digital age. Uh, I saw Terminator way too early in life. I also <laughs> look. I plan on dying in the nuclear fireball. I don't care about the after effects at this point. You, you live. You live in. Uh, you you live in one of the prime drop zones for one of those uh, Russian big boys, or exactly. uh, Batman's. So like seriously, you know, just just embrace it. Caterpillar has doomed you. Exactly. So not if they're not here anymore. No sure. We're still, we're still scheduled. I mean, we're still scheduled. Um, the, our hospital complexes are actually big enough to. I we have the largest downstate um, burn wards and radiation wards uh, outside of Chicago. So yeah, even for purposes of, uh, and we're also a telecommunication hubs. So yeah, we're due. I we're scheduled. We're gonna die still. <laughs> So, uh, Baron, are you still around? Uh, Baron, you still there? Uh, I take it he's gotten up and uh, done other things for the moment. All right. Um, so, 
And you might be busy with something. Um, you know, doggos and such. So let's see here. Uh, um, I, 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 did I, did I, rec did I answer your question the way you wanted it, Jay? Do you, do you need me to trap? Like how you, however you answer the question is however you answer the question. Like okay. I, you know, you, you've put the Otis onto me to ask the questions. I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of pulling stuff out of the top of my head as well as I've got some prompts that I can use. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, you know, really the the responses that I that I personally would look for is uh, personal experience and uh, examples of things that have come up at your own tables and how you handled it. Uh, because I, to me, that is the most valuable information that we can get out there is, you know, give me an example of what you experienced and tell me, you know, what happened, what the result or, you know, what happened, how you handled it and what the result was. Um, because that, I think, is the best information to get out to game masters or even players uh, to be able to enhance either their own tables or the tables they eventually travel to. I, I And I don't want to drag down the chat, but I, I do want to be realistic and say, like, as much as I want to have role play at my table, I'm happy with the table that I've got because, like, you know, I... I've ran for two people before for an extended period of time, and I know what it's like to not have the amount of players that I want. And I would rather have players that don't do everything I'd like, but they do check off the boxes for the things I need to get done. Like I have my minimums. Like I expect you to learn how to run your character. And even my newest player, she's, she's doing really well. They're all 13th level or 12th level and if you are playing the game for longer than six months or a year you you get used to that the the nomenclature does get to you but i don't want to make it seem like we don't rp ever we we do have managed to have our rp moments and i do get even a little bit of rp out of my guy that does not like to rp it's just <laughs> that typically that comes at a cost and that cost is NPC lives because that's about the only way he will RP is if it's the, the countdown to initiative. Um, I, I, I don't want it to seem like I just placate murder hobos. I, I want you to recognize that when you buy any module, 85% to 90% of all the published modules out there are winnable only by murder hoboism. That's how they are basically written. There are other ways to solve the problems. It's up to you and the DMs that are out there. It's up for you, I should say, because I'm speaking to DMs. Players, I can speak to you, but I really want to angle this chat to DMs. If your players have a solution to where they can use their non-combat non abilities for a peaceful resolution, or at least a bloodless, an immediately bloodless res resolution to a table situation. If they can do that, that still should be considered a win. And if you're playing a game that only rewards you with combat defeated monsters, I'm going to implore you to bend the rules and allow your characters at the table to get the XP for it. I do want that. Yeah, I I, uh, I agree with that statement wholeheartedly. You know, if my players find a solution to a problem that I hadn't even conceived as possible, um, like you know the 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 big bad guy, you know he's he's doing his thing because in his mind he he thinks he is the hero and he has to do this thing because he feels like he is saving everyone, uh, and and then the players go, hey, we know what you're doing. We're n we're not saying you're wrong we're just saying you're going about it wrong and if you went about it this way you would have better con you know, at, you know outcome and you, we wouldn't have to throw you in jail or kill you um when players do that to me i'm like uh wow okay so not only have you circumnavigated the entire encounter with this bad guy you know you've done so in a way that was bloodless you you did so in a very impressive way and you know what i'm going to reward you for that and speaking of rewards you know, when players have 
like certain amounts of knowledge about a situation or a thing like they've already kind of guessed uh, like three steps ahead in like let's say a mystery or something um but they're like hey i the player know this information i know who did it with what weapon and why they did it you know i've already figured that out but my character doesn't have all of the clues in front of him um you know so i the player am not going to use that data because my character hasn't come across it yet like i i heard them talking about it and you know so i know i the player know that they were talking about it so i know it my character doesn't do you reward players for not using their player knowledge in those situations like do you actually reward them and say hey good job you know you you didn't do the, you know, the the obvious uh, cheaty thing. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with Kai on this one. Do you ever reward your players for not using player knowledge and using only their character knowledge? Yes. By God, yes. Because that's just restraint. And if you're putting yourself into that effort, yes. Because you're actually staying in character. And by God, I, if I, it's like, I, the GM, can tell if you're if you're actually you know doing it right or doing it wrong, and by logic, by actions, and by watching the whole session, if my players can actually you know do it right, not and not resist the temptation of the dark side to do uh, to do to do, use their knowledge for evil, yeah, I'm going to give them rewards. I'm going to give them nice things. They're going to get a better a, a better reward. And the players who use all their not you know use everything above uh, above board knowledge, yeah, you're gonna get the um, you're gonna get second place. You're gonna get yeah, you won. Congratulations, and here's a miserable reward. And yeah, I I will I will not lie and say oh no, I'm fair and everybody gets to have a nice thing. Oh fuck no, I show favoritism to the people who who know what's going on and choose not to do anything and choose not to use that knowledge. Because, wow, you you were in character. Congratulations. You get to have, here, here's bonuses. Here's all the bonuses. Hey, everybody, look at how much I'm rewarding this guy for actually playing the game right. But we won, too. Yeah, here you go. Here's here's a $5 gift certificate to, um, to the local grocery store. Go buy some bubble gum. But oh, I'm sorry. Do, do you want more? Yes. Ask the guy who uh, who played nice. Maybe he'll be, I, I maybe he'll share with you. And then and the good player. Oh fuck no! I ain't giving them shit. And I'm like, good. That now next next adventure. Y'all ready? Yeah. Remember who got I who got the trip to Disney World and who got a. A coupon to McDonald's. Oh, yeah, that's how it works. It's like I if mean, you don't put the. If the Shamrock Shake is out at McDonald's, I'll take that Mickey D's uh, five dollar coupon. You know, I'll just get a large milkshake and walk, go home. I'm fine with that. You know what? Congratulations! And some players are happy with that. They're like, "Okay, cool, I got that." And the you know, like, oh, rewards a reward. I got, I got something out of it. Meanwhile, the other person's like, like, man, I, I got this wonderful sweet Harrier from Pepsi. What you get? I got a rock, but I'm happy with my rock. That's right. Be happy with your rock. As I look over at other players who are like, stupid rock. I wish I could have a have something cool. No, you don't get shit because you use your power because you use all your powers of of knowledge and you cheated me in game to give it you know before resolution to get all these really cool things before the solution you should be happy with what you cheated for oh yeah he so it's kind of risk and reward do you pay the do you pay the penalty beforehand i uh, do you take the losses in character for the better reward at the end or do you go for instant gratification now and people who use knowledge ahead of time, that's instant gratification. They're looking for that cheap, instant win. I want the power now rather than six sessions from now when they get the get, get the good reward. And, yeah, I, it doesn't matter. I've seen players on numerous occasions. You, I, 
fuck I go I I want now and then get I get chipped at the end and yeah that's just how it works so what about you shadow uh what kind of rewards do you offer your players for good in character role play and you know for them not using player knowledge in place of character knowledge usually uh if I'm playing like a, a a fantasy game, uh, most all you know sci-fi games, they don't really do the experience points thing. Uh, there's a few exceptions. Sure. Um, I'm just gonna give them the you know bonus role-playing XP that I arbitrarily come up with at the end of the game, and I might or might not make note of it, but you know, uh, you know, like to the group. But I, I usually just, you know, calculate in my head. And to be honest, a lot of times when I even give out XP, it's like a posty note at the end. And I don't tell everybody what everybody gets. Uh, sometimes I do, um, you know, especially if I want to, you know, make an example of someone who's lagging behind. Uh, because that's, you know, that's what it's for, in my opinion, to, to foster the competition. I'll be like, okay, you know, uh, you, you you know you didn't get as much because you didn't really do a lot of role playing and you know I, I try not to make a huge big deal out of it but you know it, it, it starts to become more and more noticeable as player x who's doing the great role playing is a level or two ahead of everybody else they'll figure it out i'm not going to hold their hand you know especially with old timers you know a lot of guys you know like 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 in bruce's game they, they don't care they don't care about the role playing. They just want the kills. They just want the, the, the combat and the excitement. That's cool. They come up with good ideas. You know, uh, the same thing that'll, that'll come in to play at the end. Uh, there are times when I will go, you know, boom, you get, you know, take 500 XP, you know, instantaneously. But as I get older, I, I, I prefer to do all the bookkeeping at the end of the game. And I might let people, uh, you know, recount what they think they did that would be warrant or would warrant a, an XP bonus. You know, uh, you know, did you did you do anything spectacular tonight? And I'll let them try to remember because if they thought something was spectacular, maybe in their head canon it was better than what I thought. You know, especially if it was a a, a good die roll or a, a really clever plan or something like that. You know, I'll I'll, I'll let them try to you know negotiate a little bit better xp but for the most part it, it it it's a pretty quick process and i try not to make too big a deal of, about it because there are people who just they, they really don't want to role play as much uh they figure if they talk in first person and you know they do the things and they say what they do uh as opposed to you know breaking out of character etc that for them that you know maybe that's how they role play because, you know, for them and a lot of players, it's all up in their own head. They're not going to do the voice acting. They're not going to get up and start, you know, waving their hands and doing that sort of thing. Uh, for some people, it's still, even today, uh, a little embarrassing for some folks. And I'm not going to, you know, ruin it for them and maybe get them to think that they're in the wrong group, you know, because, you know, maybe there's two guys that are, you know, really good at it. And they're, they're just, you know, plugging along, doing, you know, what they think is best. I'd rather them stick around and learn from better players and go, oh, well, he's getting XP for doing stuff like that. I think maybe I could do that and, and try to encourage them that way. And then when they finally do break out of their shell, then, you know, I'll probably like give them a little bit more XP than they deserve to kind of show them this is how it works. You know, you do the right things, you get paid, you get the rewards. If you just sit there and you're a bump on, the, a, bump on a log at my table, then, you know, you're going to get the bare minimums and, you know, eventually they'll learn. Okay. Um, Bruce, uh, do you reward your players for not using their, their player knowledge and how do you do so? Uh, I typically will kind of take stock of the situation. I recognize that my players want to play. They want to play and each one of them is a little different on the scale of, uh, do we RP or can I just fucking uh, jam out to music while I wait for you to finish the speech so I can roll for initiative? 
and there's there's a there's a huge scale there. Um, mm -hmm. For when the players are in middle, they they know that like if they if they do good things, like the one time Janet helped raise dead on a stillborn baby because she's a cleric of Freya. And Freya in this campaign world is the super deity for midwifing. And the lady that was housing the child was getting ready to birth the child, got hit by a falling timber and a, a building collapse. And so she did that. And Janet, I, I don't know, I'm not going to try to sell you guys on coming in on Monday nights and hanging out with the Bruce and Janet stream, but Janet likes to role play quite a bit. She she would she would show up in costume at a table. She showed up on costume and streams numerous times. Uh, she would try to get into voices if she would be encouraged to do so by the other players. Just a DM, probably not going to be successful on that, but we'll try. Um, but I can say that with all certainty that Janet started to cry after she helped raise the child. And like, she was actually thinking about this and she was going through the act in her head of watching a baby take its breaths and it just wrecked her. So I do give XP for bonus XP for good role play. I give bonus XP for being an MVP at the table. And for that, like, I really don't want you to be just like grog and trying to hit over 70 points of damage in single hits. That That's really boring. I don't give a shit about that. You're playing Pathfinder, which is like masturbation practice for most accountants I know. I... I'm. I mean, I you're don't. Not wrong. I, I. If my players, however, discover there's a a sub game at the table to where, if we role play, Bruce gives us more experience points. If they get it, then they start to make efforts to role play. I'll give them more experience points. I have no problem running a game that has players that they've got more powers because they learned how to actually function within the parameters that I want. Instead of just checking off the minimum number of boxes for Bruce to be happy, he has a game. Now they check off 80% or more of the boxes. That would be great. I, I would love that, but I'm, I'm not there yet. And I'm working on my players. I, uh, I'm I'm friends with Greg outside of game, and we're we're pretty cool, except for the fact that he doesn't role play. <laughs> it's fine. Crafting He'll gamer, uh, uh, say again. He'll get there someday. Maybe I hope. Yeah. I hope. Um, yield I geek, uh, 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 crafting gamer, Janet and I are just like really super good friends, and we're on each other's streams a lot. And we talk to each other daily, but she talks to my wife too. So I'm pretty okay with that. My life isn't bad. I've got a really good friend that my grand and my, my wife has a schedule that she's at work right now. She'll be home at midnight after I'm asleep. But Janet, if there's something going on, if, if Janet feels like there's something that needs to get to the wife, she'll tell the wife what's going on. <laughs> no! <laughs> Hey, that's fine. As long as the wife that's a good friendship down, there. That's that, it, it's it's a it's a different friendship. Uh, she she's also in a different state, which makes me really happy and sad at the same time too. Because she'd be that person that she'd be right here with me at this table painting. Because that's one thing Janet wants to start doing is getting miniatures. Oh God, she is hooked. And then my wife does miniatures at her desk. So that's just. No, we're not married. We're really good friends. We've been friends for like two or three years. It's great. But <laughs> I'm pleading this question. What? Flady's question? Uh, I was going to say, yeah, so Flady does have a question when you're, uh, after you're done. Go ahead. No, no, uh, go ahead and finish. 
No, but the uh, the way that I I feel it is that like you should try to at least tell your players like we're doing this right now. If you expand your range of play style to include these things that I want, I'll I'll scratch your back. Mm. And if they can't do that then I guess I'll be happy with this little bit of, that I get. I'm Good pretty question. all right with it. But some of my players are learning. Mindy's learning. Janet knows. Chris Chris will placate me when it will suit his character. He's playing an antisocial druid. I'm not certain exactly what part of that is, is, is Chris and what part of that is his character. Yeah, Chris to do things he doesn't want to do in real life. It's like telling his druid, "Let's go to the city." <laughs> so, Kai, you've got uh, something to caveat. I got a question: Are you okay? Uh, would you be okay with characters who, like, I would? There's one thing that I, that I would have. Oh, how how do I phrase this? Oh. Would it be okay to have? I would you be okay with characters who know that they're not going to be in the limelight a lot, taking the, the players taking a back seat until the right time arrives? You know, like so a character who plays more of the information gatherer, the intelligence, or the social character who will purposely sit. I will go. Okay, I know this is where the focus is at, and wait for the right. You know. And wait for the you know wait for a moment to be able to shine. Like they purposely know they're going to, to do that. And will they be penalized for purposely you know choosing to take a, a lesser role in the party? Sorry, I, it's late. I'm trying to put words together. I'm sorry. I go. No, if you want to know I'm if you'd be okay, okay if you had if you had a player at your table. That didn't take part in all the RP, but he was the spy master. He's the one who gathered yeah. all the information and presented it to the rest of the party at a later date instead of being frontline, hey, I'm there every other Saturday type character. Is that what you're asking, Kai? In a way, yes. Kai, Kai. I, yeah. Would this be because of like uh, being unable to attend on some games? Like, I have the thing here is, is that. I am more than happy because, like, I have been, I've made a character who, because of the way the, the way the party left, got left behind because I was told I wasn't good enough to be with the party, but I was still I'm a player. My characters, the characters around, and the party went off because I had missed a week, and they're like, "Well, he's not here. He's not. I, he's just a doctor. We don't need him around." And they left them behind. And I wasn't around for like three or four weeks. I, I actually had to sit through three or four sessions going, so when does it get back to me? And because oh. I'm not because I wasn't with the group and we only and we only had five hours of I uh, five hours a week and there was no way to just teleport me back into the game. And so it was one of those things where I had to wait like almost a month to be able to get back into the group. While I was still there at every session, looking at the party, going, "You fuckers," and but the thing was, was I do a lot of background stuff, but is it okay? Like having like having that character who's really only useful for every once in a while, but being an inter but being integral to the storyline or integral to the actual role playing, but just isn't there for the combat, uh, the combat wombat part. So he was just like, well, I'm over here. And then kind of having that almost secondary layer going on in the background, trying to work on other problems while the main part, while the party is off doing its own thing over here and kind of working its, you know, eventually I will work because the GM, the, the GM worked with me to get me back into the group, but he realized that, that the asshole players were the ones who left me behind. And oh, I wasn't happy, but you know, I I can't slow them down. They were adventuring and they were assholes. So the GM worked with me, but that was that GM. But I know some GMs are like, "Well, if you don't do anything in session, I'll fuck you. I ain't gonna like 
So are you okay with with a character who's doing background stuff and only tangentially supporting the party, still being able to keep up and be able to be rewarded? I'm or yes. If the if it, all it is is just combat all the time, having that character who's just like I'm not combat focused, and I'm doing other things that's supporting the plot and being able so, to be beneficial. I I have an answer for you on that. Yeah. Um, now I know Connell, you you want a caveat off this. Do you want a caveat first before I give my answer, or well, you know, you, you can go for it. Go for it. Okay. So my answer to that is yes, I do actually allow that. I've had games where uh, I've had players not able to make my table, and the the party went and left without them, um, and you know they weren't in a position where the the character could get to the party in any reasonable time. Um, my solution to that was one-on-one -on -one sessions with the player. I'm like, hey, your players, you know, your character's not back at, at the, the group yet. Um, do you want to have a one-on-one -on -one with me when you have time? And we'll, you know, hash out what your character does. He's like, yeah, sure, that's fine. Uh, and we did that for the, I think it was like five, six weeks. He had to be away from the table because he had other things to do, other responsibilities. He eventually did come back and the group did pick him back up. And he was three levels higher than the rest of the group was. And they couldn't understand that. I was like, well, he wasn't in that battle. He wasn't in this battle. I'm like, no, and the, you're right. He wasn't. And here's what he was doing instead. And I gave them the list of everything that the character had been doing while they were, you know, going and dealing with something else. He was dealing with other behind the scenes issues, tracking down the, the information network of the, one of the villains that they were trying to stop. Uh, he was uh, working, you know, the, the the back routes of or the back channels of all of the uh, city's underground network trying to undermine the you know one of the three big bads that they had to contend with uh, and it just so happened that he had to get into fights with whole guilds almost by himself um, and the way the 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 player navigated those things. It, I'm like, yeah, you know what? You get the, this experience for doing that. And, uh, you know, if that levels you, that levels you. Awesome. Go get, you know, go get training. Go get what you need to do. Um, you know, level up your gear. And, you know, and, the, you know, like I said, when the, the players re had him rejoin, he was three levels higher than them. And they were just like, I don't understand how that's possible. And, and then I explained it. They're like, can I have one-on-one -on -one sessions with you? I'm like, no, because you guys, you know, had left him behind <laughs> to go do, you know, go take care of this minor thing that was just a tangent item. It wasn't even the main, you know, my main source of, of hook. Like, that was a tangent hook that you decided to make all on your own, which is fine. Um, and so, so yeah, I absolutely uh, believe that characters can take a back seat you know, from the main group for a little while. But the point is to get them back into the group and reintegrate the whole party back together again. Uh, now, uh, Connell, you you had something to add on that. Yeah, it kind of more or less you said what I was going to say. Uh, I have a person who wants to play, but he's a doctor, and he has he's always on call. It's just, for, you know, just part of the deal. And he's like, I'm playing fifth edition. He's like, is there any way I can play? And when I can show up, I'll show up. And, you know, I'm like, yeah, we can make this work. And he's like, what can I be? I'm like, you want to play? He's like, yes. I'm like, how about a, a do rogue for a few levels and we'll make you a uh, spy master. And one on one, you know, I'll have one on one uh, uh, sessions with him, like you, uh, like you said. And he will, we will just play spy game. I mean, that's just what it breaks out to. When he's at the table, he will give a uh, pinpoint, a pinpoint uh, discussion of what he knows is going, what he's found out, and gives the rest of the players. Does he see combat? Fairly rarely, but he is he he's the one who keeps the party. He is Oracle. If you're going to use a DC reference, he is uh, uh, whatever. He is uh, you know. Spider, uh, whatever he is, the spy master. He's the one who keeps them informed of what's going on. So yes, I allow it. It's got to be. A, uh, it's a case by case scenario, of course. Of course. Okay. Now, a person we haven't heard much from, um, Baron. Are you? Uh, are you there? 
I'm going to assume not. All right. Well, Shadow um, wants to say something. yeah, Shadow, you got something to add to this? You are muted, sir. He's smoking. He's got his hand is up to hold a cigarette. Oh. Yeah. And oh, okay. Kind of gestured. It looks like Baron's not here. Um, but yep. we are cruising up toward the end of the show, so. Yeah. Yes, we are. So, um, you know, I I think that's really all I have uh, question wise on uh, player knowledge versus character knowledge. Um, you know, I I agree with a lot of the things that were said. Um, and even, you know, with me getting ready to run the Bronze Age game, you know, I'm going to have to be able to separate uh, the player's knowledge, you know, the, the you know modern era knowledge from uh, Bronze Era technology levels. Uh, it's just going to be something I have to address, like early on, session zero. Uh, I might have to remind them, you know, throughout the game, like, hey, you know, uh, ballistas don't exist in this time period because uh, you don't have the the iron or steel to be able to make them, um, or you know, whatever the case might be. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it was a fairly good discussion. Uh, so. Bruce, um, anything you'd like to add on to this uh, before we close the night? I, uh, I, I, I do want to encourage you guys at your tables to play to the level of immersion that is most comfortable for you. Uh, and, and as much as we do, hi, Shauner, uh, as much as we do endeavor to eventually have full thespian range character role play at our table <laughs> um most of us are just kind of happy with the fact we we get to play and i i really think that you know there's there's expectations of what we do want and i'm over here with the uh monty python assault on uh, this strange castle and i i i think i'm kind of happy with what we've got you know it's it's a it, it's a cruel world and you know you you get the table that you you farm for and and that's the thing i i look for players that were into tactical play first and that's that's why i've got the players i do um if there was better harmonics at the table i'd have other people at the table and you guys would understand that it's just just um i I can only do so much as a GM, but I, I can endeavor to make a, a weekend or two free throughout the course of time and be able to get a new table started. And eventually, you know, I will try to farm a new table because I, I need to beta test the product that I'm getting ready to release here in about a month, month and a half. I, I was really, really wanting to hit Labor Day for this, this uh, deadline, but I don't think I'm going to be able to hit it because there's spells. And spells take a lot. Um, yes. Yes, they do. Yeah. I, I, I want to say for those of you that are waiting for this, I appreciate your patience. I'm sorry it's taking so long, but we will be in contact for beta testing here very shortly. And uh, do, can, do continue to watch our show on Thursdays because one of those beta tests will be actually be here. Uh, these guys will hit it first and then I'll have a, a table erupt with some ideas because I, I actually want to do single class testing with four or five people and mm. and do like a party of clerics, a party of fighters, a party of arcane types. I think that would be a different way to play test and just to see balance in action. Party of and I think clerics Stop your heresy there, Shadow. Um uh Yes, the, please. The cleric class is the route into Paladin. It's it's not a it's not something you start with. I think maybe in the future I might add Ranger to the list of classes available from the get go, but for right now, Marshal, Divine, Arcane, Skilled, and Bard are the five classes that I'm going to have, and everything comes off of those five. Just all depends on what it is. Like if you're going to go for the Paladin. You want to start off as a cleric or a divine graduate cleric and go to paladin because i i just the more i read the the appendix in i don't see why a paladin would be a 16 year old person unable to contain their 
hormones and you're entrusted with the responsibilities of a paladin, I don't see it. I have see a paladin Jack? being an evolution. I was say, have you met Jack? He has no hormones. Though no, he he does. <laughs> he does. And it, it's you you you, you get those kids that are different. Yeah, once in a generation, you'll have a Joan of Arc, but that's not something that's immediately available. And so I, I think having it to where you have to graduate, at least be a six level character before you go into something like Ranger, Barbarian, Fighter, Wizard. But the thing is that your previous levels do add into that. So you're at least getting the abilities from that. You're just not called per se a Paladin. You're a Paladin now. Whereas you weren't always a paladin. You weren't always a cleric. You were divine touched. But that's that's just how that works. I, I like the idea of subclasses. I like the idea of primary classes. And I think that'll work a lot better for the system that I'm running because I I just I kind of want to drop it back to basics and then have the players decide where they go with their characters. All right. Well, um, I think that rounds us out for the night. Um, you know, thank you, chat, for uh, unless uh, hold on, I just got a message on Discord. Nope. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you, chat, for spending your evening with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and you can catch us next week on Table Breakers, where we will be talking about a new topic. Um, the topic, I believe, is cr uh, critical hits. Am I correct in that? I believe so. Okay, critical hits and how to make them more interesting. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that's about it from us tonight. Have a good night, everyone. Hey, if, if you guys, uh, before we before we round this out, if, if the <laughs> chat here, I got twelve people in various networks. Um, I need you guys to send some uh, positive thoughts, some uh, broadcast prayers per se for uh, for uh, Six Nations. It's got a problem with a doggo. I know dogs aren't exactly mm, yes. seeking members of the family, but I know if Jade was having problems with one of his huskies, I would sure want it, the husky to get the problem, you know, healed up. And there's there's no difference here. I want Six Nations not to have oh, any problems wow. with his little chimini. So if you guys could do that yeah. before we close out, that'd be great. You know, hey, really quick before we close out, you guys want to do our rounds? What we got coming up, or do we just want to bypass it this week? Tomorrow night on Janet's channel. On Janet's channel tomorrow night, we are going to be doing the shit show. I don't know if it's at eight thirty or nine p.m. Janet will be putting the link in her Discord. So I put the link for her Discord in the chat. Let me do that one more time. Swing by her Discord. And uh, we should be broadcasting. I know it's going to step on the rando stream. I love Max. He's a good guy. He, he John's got some good things going on with Legion of Myth. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to pimp out some things in my own side here. Come visit us at the shit show when you're done there. Uh, we don't we don't make uh, as much as it's enjoyable to make fun of retards in the RPG industry or people that you absolutely have share no opinions with whatsoever. Um, it, it, Janet's stream is a little more serious, and uh, at the same time, we try to keep it pretty light. There, there's a lot of weight there, but go ahead and check us out. And that's Friday night, Saturday. This channel we have our game stream. You'll see Connell and maybe uh, Shadow and Kyle show up in the chat. I'm not certain about that, but I mean, it's a Saturday. I, I really don't expect a lot of people to show, but if you guys do, that's great. I look forward to killing my players. I mean, uh, having an enjoyable game. Uh, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Me, Shadow, Bo, Mark, and I think Omen Out's back in the area. We'll be talking about going to detention back in the 80s. There's a jock. There's a stoner, there's a prep, you know, high school uh, clickbait. We'll be talking about the 1980s uh, Breakfast Club that was based in a small town in fuck off Cornfield, Illinois. <laughs> Anybody else want to uh, pimp anything out? I got uh, crap tons of stuff. Uh, I don't exist until next Thursday. <laughs>
Ty, you think that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Everybody take care. Tell Kai to enjoy himself on vacation. And I'll see